petty. <laughs> so as loud as y'all just clap for me, can y'all clap louder for Jim? Jim is actually one of the first people I met when I uh, came to Grace Walk, and he is everything that our church embodies. Amen. Uh, servitude, uh, a God's heart, friendly. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but in the last year and a half, every time we have a welcome, he will walk from his post in the back, specifically up to give us a hug on stage Amen. every time he's here. Um, there is not a man created like Jim that so I love you, brother. Appreciate you. Amen. Amen. That'll teach you to make them clap for me next time. I know you are. <laughs> All right. So um, grace with this platform again, and I'm super appreciative. I told the church the last time that I wasn't going to be like all fire and brimstone. I said it was going to be really nice and cuddly, uh, but then I completely forgot that I don't get to tell my own words. I have to tell what thus said the Lord. So I apologize because this is not going to be sunshine and rainbows either. <laughs> but there's going to be some sprinkles of good stuff, and by the end, we're all going to feel better. Amen? Amen? I'll take that. I'll take that. So it is the year of our Lord 2017. And there is this young man, dashing young man, very <laughs> handsome, well-dressed, phenomenal keyboard player, kind of good-looking, decent singer. If you haven't figured out, it's who I'm talking about. It's right, looks good in white, got on, got on some golf pants, kind of looks like a miniature Tiger Woods. Um, so I'm at this church that I'm not gonna say the name of, and it is New Year's Eve on a Sunday. And in the black church, we call this position the minister of music. We don't call it worship director or worship pastor or whatever. We call it the minister of music. I'm the minister of music at this church. Pastor gets up on stage in the middle of service and says, hey church, I have an announcement to make. Our faithful Minister of Music, this is his last Sunday, and he's moving to Atlanta, Georgia to pursue his musical career. Only problem with that is I'm sitting on stage on piano like, I am? <laughs> that was news to me. I didn't know I was going anywhere. So long story short, I got fired on stage in the middle of service. Kind of sucks, huh? <laughs> and so in that moment, my flesh, my family, my friends, even a couple of people who didn't know me all that well was like, man, I'll go, I'll knock his friends out for you because that's just, it's out of pocket, right? Here's the funny thing. Um, the guy who was supposed to come in and replace me got stuck in a snowstorm in Pittsburgh and couldn't make it. And so the same guy that fired me on Sunday morning came back to me and said, hey, is there any way you can stick around and play for a New Year's Eve service tonight? I'm looking at all y'all's faces, and y'all like, cuss word no. <laughs> and in that moment, again, my flesh, my family was like, man, I'll tell you where to go, how fast to get there, and who you can take with you. but that would have been disobedient to my assignment. And so in that moment, despite all the indications that I should have just kicked him in the shin and ran, I, I did what I was supposed to do. And I went and I played for that watch night service. Watch night is like New Year's Eve service. And I played for that New Year's Eve service and I'm sitting there on keys, and I'm trying to like fix my face because as you can imagine, everyone in the church is like, oh, congratulations on your new opportunity. I don't have a new opportunity. <laughs> and so I gotta like put my game face on um, in this moment as I am now sitting in this church that I no longer work for. And 
for New Year's Eve services in certain churches, that's a great time for testimony service. That's when people come up and tell of the goodness of God or how they've come through. So this guy, he, he walks in, and he's been through it. And he comes up and he gives a testimony, and it sounds like a, a sad country music song. I lost my house, I lost my car, I lost my dog, like I lost my job, I was homeless, I was hooked on meth. He went through everything. And every time he went through a, a period of adversity, he said, but I didn't die. I lost my house, but I didn't die. I was thrown in jail where they beat me up, but I didn't die. My wife is gone, my kids are gone, but I didn't die. I was hooked on meth, but I didn't die. And I'm sitting here with my first world problems on, on piano, looking at this man who's literally lost everything, who is telling me about the joy of the Lord in the midst of a season that is exponentially worse than mine. And in that moment, I realized, God, you didn't have me here for them. You had me here because you needed me to see what he had for me. And then it hit me in that moment. Some seven years later, now is the time to tell of this ministry because the day I got fired and trying to figure out what to do with my life, because I'm, I'm a musician at heart. That's just who I am. That's who I was created to be. Two days later, literally two days later, CCV calls randomly out the blue and says, hey, we've heard a lot about you. We would love if you would come and join us and be a part of our ministry and come play here. Random call out the blue, got hired on the spot, played there for five years, including one time where I had the unprecedented honor to sing one of the songs that I wrote on stage in front of a stream of over 60,000 people. And sometimes, even now, I ask myself, if I would have walked up to that man and knocked his fronts out like I wanted to, I wonder if God would have honored that and that phone would have rang. You can't. You can't, you can't throw them hands. You can't. That's what I got church for. <laughs> and the, the crazy thing about it is, it was just last week, I'm praying with my family doing the like nighttime prayer thing and we're just kind of like talking through this moment and my son remembers this from seven years ago and in that moment the first thing he quotes is oh but I didn't die and I'm like this kid I ain't never seen him look up from his phone in church in, in years and I realized it resonated with him some seven years later that no matter what we go through it's not going to kill us. Amen. And here's an example of someone who has been through almost all of it. And if he can have a smile on his face, then why can't I? Amen. And it hit me. I didn't know I was going to be here. I didn't know that the pathway that God had for, for us was going to be through CCV and land at Grace Walk, where now I have the esteemed honor of being your worship director. And I have this esteemed honor of bringing the message of the good news to the people. I didn't know any of that. All I knew was that this man said I was moving to Atlanta and I had just renewed my lease on my house. <laughs> so I wasn't going nowhere. But that's evidence that God had a plan that was far greater than what I could imagine. Right. Amen? Yeah. What's crazy is I feel like I could stop right there and just open the doors to the church and we can go home. <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, the storm provides. The storm provides. Yes, yes, the storm provides. There is provision in the storm. Please turn your Bibles, your phones, your iPads, your Samsung tablets, whatever you have, please turn it to the book of James, the first chapter, the second verse. If you don't have anything, there's two screens up here you can look at. It says, my brethren, count it all joy for when ye fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Is there anybody in this church today that wants nothing? Thank you for being honest. 
Somebody at last service raised his hand. Nah, bro. There's something that you... I've got a 12-year-old daughter. She wants everything. And I'm going to hear about that on the way home because she's in the back. Hi, baby. Um, can you imagine being happy about going through adversity and at the end of that adversity, God has told you that you will lack and want for nothing at all. Nothing. I can't imagine what that would feel like. But then again, I also sometimes have a hard time imagining a God that loves me knowing all of my deepest, darkest secrets, and he still loves me for who I am. Amen. 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 Touch your neighbor and say, the storm provides. Yeah, 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 yeah. The storm definitely provides. The storm also preludes. Big fancy word that means it proceeds, it goes forth. There's two ways to look at this when you say that the storm proceeds. The first way you can look at a preceding storm is that a storm will go before you and clear out your pathway and make your pathway visible so that you know which direction to go in. That's a beautiful thing about this storm. The book of Isaiah, 43rd chapter, in the 18th verse in the New Living Translation, it says, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I am about to do something new. The King James Version says, behold, I will do a new thing. See, I've already begun it. Do you not see it? I will make pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the field will thank me, the jackals and the owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Pause. The Bible says that there's jackals and owls that will give God praise for provision. So that means we have no excuse not to thank God for what he is doing for us when he's doing it. That was real cute. But I'm talking about our Lord and Savior who did everything that we needed him to do when he needed to do it. The Bible says, yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. The storm preludes. The other way that we can look at a preceding storm is it's a prelude to what's to come. The storm will reveal what is our pathway for God's glory in the future. The book of Romans, famous, famous scripture, the King James Version says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not to be worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. What is special about this scripture is God not only has said that our latter will be greater than our past, but he also has said that when we get there, we'll realize that we already had it embedded in us. I came here today to tell you, if you don't hear anything else, that whatever you need in God, it's already in your possession. God continues to tell us, we'll see in another scripture later, later on, that when he needs us to be strong, it's something that we already possess. There's a glory that's already in us that he's going to reveal to us at the appropriate time. And that should give us confidence in knowing that no matter what comes our way, we already have the tools to win. That's why church was singing about winners. That's why we believe that we're winning souls to Christ and making winners in life, because we realize that the victory has already taken place. We fight from a position to preserve our victory, not to obtain it. The storm preludes. And for anybody who is struggling with this concept, let me let you know right now that our storms are necessary. Turn to somebody and say, your storm is necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to go through it. And if you don't think that you have to go through it, let me ponder this on you. Let me, let me, let me paint this picture for you real quick. So it's no secret that humanity at certain times sucks. We don't treat each other right. 
they're killing each other in Israel and Gaza right now. We've got a political race that, that seems like a, 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 a bad episode of Mean Girls. We are in a situation, I said it, and you can email us, it's the truth. We don't act right. And God is sitting up in heaven with his arms crossed looking at us like, I did not create you guys to be this way. Or maybe I did. But at the end of the day, if you don't think that the way that we behave when we make choices that don't reflect God and how he's created us, it pains him. So if he has to suffer from our own actions, why do we think that we are exempt from that suffering too? You good, sir? You all right? I, I, I feel you. I, I, feel, I feel like that about my praise. Sometimes I just got to get it out. I almost fell. Yikes. What I mean by that is quite simple. Jesus did not die in his sleep. Jesus did not die of lethal injection. Jesus did not die peacefully. Jesus died a very gruesome, a very detailed, a very bloody death. And there was significance to his suffering. And if God had manifested himself in the flesh just to deliver us for our sins, then why do we believe that we are exempt from suffering on our own? My God today. The storm is necessary. The storm preludes. The storm also precludes. That's a fancy, fancy word of saying that the storm prevents. Yes, I'm going to give you guys some SAT words today. Yes, I will use them in a sentence. I will use the country of origin. We'll go through a whole nine. The storm precludes. That means that the storm prevents. What are you saying, Reg? I'm saying that there are times where you want to go out and do you, and let's be honest, most of the time when we try to go do things on our own, it does not end well. We have a lot of confidence in our actions until it comes time to get to the result. And then we're like, oh, what have I just done? And the significance of a storm before us is sometimes the storm will keep your behind right where it needs to be so that you can't go out and mess anything else up. You are by yourself in solitude, and that's where you can hear from God the way you need to hear from God. We're dealing with a, a storm right now. It, it, it's uh, Helena, Helena, H H Hel Helen, Helen. There's a hurricane <laughs> that the whole Southeast is dealing with. And I've spoken to some family in the Atlanta area who had to just be still, couldn't go anywhere. Why? Check this out because the power was out and she couldn't open the garage door. Had another friend who has an, an electric vehicle, power's out, charge, the car can't get charged, they can't go nowhere. The storm literally made them be still. And the crazy thing is, imagine if they had gone out in it. They may not be here today. The storm sometimes can puts you in a place where it makes you be still and hear from God and not go out and mess more things up, but be still enough to understand how God wants you to do things. And when the storm clears, you are in a position to carry out his will the way that he intended it to. Deuteronomy 31 and 8, the New Living Translation says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. The storm precludes. The storm prevents. The storm also procures. Now, the SAT word, procures. To procure means to obtain with care. What are you saying now, Reg? You're using all these big words. The storm is a perfect opportunity for you to evangelize, which is exactly why we're living this life. Because if you go out right now to Carabas, yeah, I feel it too. Hmm. 
That mama soup is real. Um, if you go out to Carabas right now and you find the family, the perfect family with the nice house and the good job and the six figures and, and, and the pretty faces and not a care in the world, but they don't know God, and you say, hey, let me introduce you to Jesus, their response would be, for what? My life is fine. I don't need Jesus until it all falls apart. And it's going to fall apart. And I'm not saying that to be doom and gloom, but at the end of the day, we're all going to go through something. God made his own son die on our behalf. So you think that you're going to be free from an an assignment that's just not realistic. We're going to go through something. And when we do, that is the perfect opportunity to grab someone who is in the midst of that adversity and say, hey, I know a better way. I know a man named Jesus that can offer you peace that surpasses all understanding, that can offer you joy in the midst of your adversity. Let me introduce you to the best decision that you will make in your life. And it only happens in the midst of that storm. How many times have you, pe- have you seen people come to Christ when every day was a sunny day? To this day, to this day, the Sunday after 9-11 remains the most attended church service Sunday in American history because we saw an unprecedented attack on our soil. We were scared to death, and everyone was like, okay, God, that I've never acknowledged before, I think I need you right now. The storm is an opportunity for us to grab those who would otherwise not see Jesus and allow them to see hope in a hopeless situation. The storm procures. The book of James, the fifth chapter, in the ESV version, it says, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. When you grab somebody out of darkness and pull them into the light, you're not just saving them, you're saving yourself. And that's what we do. That's what we do. I jokingly said last, last service that, especially out here in Arizona, you, sometimes you'll see these streets and there's a sign that says, do not cross when flooded. Y'all laughing because you realize that they only put that sign up because some nut job crossed when it was flooded. And you have to realize also that in order to put that sign up, that means that somebody cared enough to stop the next nut job from doing the same thing that the last nut job did. Because I'm petty. I would sit back and just watch as many people as possible just go through and like, how many times are you going to see somebody float away before you realize maybe this isn't a good idea? But that's the thing the storm precludes. The storm is the way that we can turn to someone and say, I've been through what you're going through, and you may not want to keep going down that route. Let me give you another option that's going to be such a better way. I don't know about you, but I wish that I would have listened to some of the people who gave me advice when I was younger, because now I sound just like them when I'm in my 40s. And all them times when my mom was like, do this, I'm like, you stinky lady. I'm saying it verbatim. I'm talking to my kids the same exact way. My mom looking at me like, I told you. (laughs) The storm procures. My God today. The storm also protects. The storm protects because sometimes we don't understand the difference between when things are on purpose and things are for purpose. My God, today, sometimes people have motives and they do things the way that they want to do things, and sometimes God has a purpose for your pain. God has a purpose for your journey. God has an intention for the things that you're going through. And we are blinded sometimes to the difference between when things are on purpose and when things are for purpose. There are benefits to going through a storm. I'm going to stop here and give you guys a a quick note. In my studying this week, it was crazy. I was going through this, and I was Googling, and I was going through 
the Bible app, and I was just taking a bunch of different resources to put this message together, and every single time I would type in something in a search engine, the result always came back as protection from the storm and not for the storm. And I'm sitting there like, no, Google, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you to tell me how can the storm provide me protection from everything else, not what protection do I need from the storm? And that's when I realized that intelligence truly is artificial. Because I'm like, you're not doing what I'm asking you to do. And then God's like, so now you know how I feel. But finally, through some very creative searching, I realized that there are tremendous benefits to a storm. There's environmental benefits, there's health benefits to a storm. The environmental benefits, especially out here, we live in the the desert because some some genius decided 100 something years ago to stop here in the middle of 150 degrees and say, let's build a city. (laughs) And here we are in this dust bowl, this desert, this dry and thirsty land, and the storm comes, we, we call them monsoons, and I read that when a storm comes, it restores the ionic balance in the atmosphere. That's pretty scientific. Let's break that down for two seconds. What that means is a storm can fix the things that are broken that you can't see. My God today. That sounds like my savior who continues to fix things that are broken that I can't even see that are detrimental to me down the road. The storm protects. The storm can put out fires. We have a fire season here in Arizona where every summer there's random fires that pop up all over the state. Some of them are even caused by the storm and some of them are cured by the storm. The same lightning that creates this fire can be put out by the rain that comes with that same storm. That's prophetic. I ain't got time to get into that. We'll we'll do that next time. But storms can end droughts. Storms can even protect us from intruders. Way back in the day, there were certain countries that would build their land on rocks out in the sea because they knew that if anyone tried to come get them, the storm would stop them. The storm was literally their bodyguard. If they tried to invade them, they would get lost in the waves, in the, in the sea, and the storm was, was literally providing protection for them in safe harbor. There's also personal health benefits to a storm. It is a scientific fact that storms improve our mental health. If you don't believe that, then look at anyone who lives in Arizona on the three days a year that it rains. Are we not just in a better mood? You said no. It's true though, like when it rains, we're just like, we're different people. Oh my God, there's, it's rain. Come look, it's raining. There's water falling from the sky. Ah. We're different people when it rains. We're in a better mood. Our mental health is better. Our pulmonary health is better. I don't know if I got any other pulmonary kids in here. Anybody else got their inhaler in their pocket? Is it just me? Well, that sucks, because if, if I need an inhaler, I guess I'm just fresh out of luck. Yikes, 300 people and no inhaler, huh? There you go, the prayer of Jesus. Just, we'll pray until you can go to Walgreens and get me an inhaler. We have dust storms. We've got bad air, and when it rains, the air is clear. It's a good day. We want to go outside, and they even sang, I want to go outside in the rain. If you're under 30, you've never heard that song before, (laughs) unless it was remixed by Meek Mill or somebody else was going to jail. 
You can edit that out later. Um, the storm increases our immunity because of vitamin D, the healthy vitamin D, not the one that comes from the sunshine that gives us cancer, but the, the vitamin D is embedded in a storm system. And I just read this this week, that rainwater has increased amounts of alkaline. The same alkaline water that you guys spend five, six dollars a bottle at the gas station is in the rainwater. Legal disclaimer, hey, online people, I did not say go out and drink rainwater because if you get sick, you cannot sue the church. And you can't sue me because I ain't got nothing. <laughs> he said the checks in the mail. That's hilarious. Psalms 48, David, one of the greatest songwriters in the world, he said in 46, the first to the third verse, he said, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its water roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake and it's, with its swelling, Selah. I would implore that we would read this backwards. And I'm not saying that we need to like, rewrite the song because David is clearly one of the, the best songwriters who has ever lived. However, I don't think anybody wants to go through what David went through to write some of them songs. But let's read this backwards. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, and even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, therefore we will not fear, because God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. The storm protects us. The storm is also proof of God's existence. The storm proves. Turn to your neighbor and say, the storm proves. The storm is proof that God is with you because when the enemy comes in like a flood and it seems like everything else around you is being shot to hell, that's when God can verify that his promise to you is still yea and amen. Yes. I'm going to try to do this quickly. Victor, come here for a second. You can walk around the stairs over there. I don't know if I've ever formally introduced. This is my son, Victor. Hold this. So we're going to look at this this cable right here, and we're going to call this prayer. Amen? What is this? Y'all are quick learners. I love it. I want to illustrate something and get somebody delivered today because this lifeline right here is proof that no matter who you are, no matter what you have gone through, no matter what deeds you have done, God is always no further away from you than this link. Don, come here for a second. And even when someone else has that link, you see God is the same exact distance away. Whether it's a short, black, very good, handsome singer, <laughs> or a tall, white, even more handsome CR director. Lisey. No matter who you are, God is always right here. And no matter where you go, He's always the same distance from you. Thank you, Victor. What I wanted to share with somebody today is no matter who you are, no matter what you do, do not let anybody make you feel like they have a tighter, more personal connection to God. Do not let somebody shame you into thinking that God will not answer your prayer because you don't say the right words or you don't pray enough or you don't go to church enough or you don't eat your vitamins or you don't pay your taxes or whatever it is. God is not that type of God. God is just as close to you as a crackhead as he, as he is to you if you are the, the best person on earth. Because of that link, that prayer keeps God in the same proximity to you. The storm is proof of God's existence. And I know that because that meth head came into church one day and taught somebody who grew up in church for years 
what it means to be faithful through adversity. Matthew 8, the 18th chapter, the 27th verse says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, and he gave commandment to depart to the other side, and a certain scribe came unto him and said, Master, I will follow thee wherever you go. And Jesus said unto them, The foxes have holes, the, the birds have the birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And another disciple said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. He was like, come with me. You ain't got to worry about that. He ain't going nowhere. <laughs> and then when he entered into a ship, the disciples followed him. And I've got like an illustrative mind. And it said, behold, there arose a great tempest into the sea. That's a fancy way of saying a storm. And in so much, the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Pause. The, the, the scripture just said that the storm is getting really bad and the ship is going through it and Jesus is knocked out. He is not bothered. And so they woke him up. The, the disciples came unto him and woke him up saying, Lord, save us because we're going to perish. And I would imagine Jesus was in that good sleep any parents in here that been in that good sleep and then the kids came in and woke you up for no good reason? <laughs> they woke him up and said, God, the, the storm's really bad and we're going to die. He was like, so why are you afraid? You have little faith. He arose and he rebuked the winds and there was a great calm. And this is the part that doesn't make sense to me, not in the Bible, but by the people. The men said, oh, Wow. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? Isn't that why you woke him up in the first place? <laughs> the storm got bad. You woke him up to calm the storm. Then he calmed the storm. He's like, oh, my gosh, he calmed the storm. <laughs> wow, he did exactly what we asked him to do. Reg, where are you going with this? I'm saying this. I'm saying that the storm will prove that the God that we pray to sometimes, and even though we declare how great he is, still have a little bit of doubt that he's going to do it this time. And he comes and he does exactly what we ask him to do. And it's evidence of our faith. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The storm proves. I'm almost done. The storm also prepares because your increased faith is proof of God's promise. Very quickly, the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, the third verse, it says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. How many people in here have ever prayed for patience? Bingo. So for anybody who has not prayed for patience, I, I know you heard that like that grumbling, that kind of sarcastic laughter. That means that the people who have paid for uh, uh, excuse me, prayed for patience have understood what that means. If you don't know what that means, then what that means is the second that you pray for patience, you finna go through hell. I mean all kinds of hell. Because God will not gift wrap in a pretty package patience and say, here you go. He's going to make you go through it so that you can demonstrate that patience and that perseverance, which means the next time you pray, you pray for Twizzlers. <laughs> the storm prepares. The storm gives us all that we need to know, the confidence that the next time the storm comes, we will be ready because we got through it the last time. Any roller coaster fans in here? He said, nope. <laughs> Does anybody remember your first time on a roller coaster? And you, exactly, and you stood there and you looked up and you were like, it goes all the way up to the heavens. It's so tall. And then you get on, and you are praying to God, making all those promises. God, if you let me live through this, I promise I'll never eat another Snicker bar in my life. And in that moment, you are rethinking all of your life's decisions. 
and you're strapped in and you realize at this point, the only way to get back to the station is you're going to have to go through it. And here you are strapped into some wheels on a rail and you got to go through whatever the roller coaster is. And again, you are rethinking your life choices and then you get to the top of the hill and you go through that roller coaster and it's the best time of your life and you get off it and what do you say? Again! <laughs> I want to go again. <laughs> Does somebody hear what I'm saying today? It's going to happen. You're going to get scared. It's going to look like you can't make it through. And then God's going to give you all the tools that you need to get through. And you're going to get on the other end of that. But that wasn't so bad. And you're going to look at the devil. Bring it. Because the last time, I didn't even get a paper cut. So you're going to have to come better than that. Do you guys hear what I'm saying today? It's, it's just like when the storm will prepare us with confidence and understanding, like we said in Romans 8 and 18, that the glory is already in us. We believe that all things work together for two reasons. Why? Because we love him and because we're called according to his purpose. The Bible says that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We, there's so many scriptures that talk about how we are going to get a victory by getting resources that he already gave us. It's already working in us. And the storm is the perfect opportunity for us to tap in to these resources that we would otherwise not have. Have you ever seen somebody walking around Walmart in full fatigues with a gun in their hand when there's no war? You look foolish. Halloween is in October. It's April. Chill out. But we question whether or not we have the resources in moments where we don't need to use the resources. But when it comes time to use those resources, that's when God reveals to us that we had it the whole time. I hope I'm hope helping somebody in this place today. I'll leave you with this. In the book of 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, it says, Beloved, I think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. It's what trials are for. They're to try you. As though some strange thing excuse me, as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, there it is again, shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And if ye be reproached with the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and the God rests upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. I'm going to pause right there. Sometimes when you're going through something, somebody will tell you just like Job, man, you crazy for having the faith that you got. They call you unrealistic. Anybody heard that before? You're not being realistic for trusting God this radical way. Like, I understand that you have faith and whatever, but the realism is that this is, this, this is just what's going to happen. But the Bible I read just says on, on someone else's part, he's evil spoken of, but on, on your part, he's glorified because when the outcome that you had faith in comes to pass, you can look at everybody who doubted you and said, I knew it. I had unwavering faith. And it says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody or as a grace walk church member in other men's matters. But yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Amen. The storm provides. With every head bowed, if you are sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And if you feel like there's just this constant barrage 
of adversity that's just coming your way over and over and over and over again, if you have allowed the enemy to infiltrate your mind to think that you are undeserving of good things, can you let your hands just rest in the air today? If you believe that this false prophecy, that neglect is deserved because of your good deeds, I just want to change your heart posture this afternoon and let you know that God loves you and the trying of your faith is giving you the patience that you need to get through not just this storm, but every storm that is to come. And if you haven't heard it from anyone else in life, I'm here to tell you today with your hands resting in the air that you matter, you matter to us, but most importantly, you matter to the king. He created you just how you are, and he loves you that way. And if you don't know this man that we declare as our savior, today is a perfect day to try Jesus. Repeat after me, saints uh, that don't know and even the saints that do know God. Repeat after me, Lord, I realize that you loved me this whole time and I'm ready to love you back in Jesus' name, amen.